What's up, ladies and gentlemen? The Pod Father Nate here from the Journey into Comics podcast, the flagship show of the Journey into Comics network. I just want to make sure you guys know you can tune in every single Monday for a brand new episode of our show, where if it's comic book related, we've got you covered. The following, following. the following, is Journey into Comics, 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 Network, 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 Production, Production. To a nicer guy, it couldn't happen. I'm the man of the hour, the man with the power. Diamonds are forever. He put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family. And what you gonna do, Andre? History beckons the macho man. Yeah. The best there is. The best there was. Austin 316 said I just whipped your ass. Two words for you. Two words. Do I have everybody's attention now? What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Season 3, Episode 6 of Journey Into Wrestling. It's me, it's me, it's NJP, your host, Nate. Hope everybody's doing fantastic on this fly-ass Sunday. You guys, I'm about to do something that we've never really done at great length on this podcast, and I'm really excited to jump into genuinely uncharted waters. I did something very much outside of my comfort zone over the weekend, and I actually sat back and I checked out Impact Wrestling Bound for Glory. What? Oh yeah, it's true. So check this out. Here's a funny little story. 13 years ago, Podmaster Brando over at Game Addicts Podcast. Check them out at GameAddictsPodcast.com. Uh, introduced me to TNA Wrestling. Total nonstop action wrestling. This was at a time they had people like Samoa Joe and AJ Styles, PD Williams and Eric Young and um, Bobby Roode and James Storm and uh, an amazing list of talent. Uh, before things got really kind of muddled a little bit, you know. Uh, so anyways, he showed me this Bound for Glory 2005 or 2004. I can't really perfectly remember if it was 13 or 14 years ago. It was somewhere in that ballpark. He's like, man, you're going to fucking love this wrestling. It's ridiculous. So I'm like, okay, and I, I did. Six-sided ring, it was different. It was innovative. It was fast. There was an X-Division title match that was crazy. I mean, it was amazing, genuinely. It was genuinely amazing. So everybody's been kind of buzzing and hyping on Impact Wrestling's really good now. Don Callis is in there. He's doing things how he would run wrestling, and it seems like it's working out nicely, and like things are going smoothly. So it was kind of like I had to pay tribute to the fact that at one point in time I really did love this product and give some people who I do and don't know a chance, right? That's what you got to do in wrestling sometimes. You got to give it a chance and just let it sell you. That's what I did, folks, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to break it down, and we're going to talk about the, uh, you know, here's the really interesting thing, right? So there are some names on this card I do recognize. There are some names on this card I don't recognize. I have notes for everything. I have a way we're going to run this down. It's different than we've done it before on Journey into Wrestling here. So what the plan is, is essentially I'm going to run down the whole card. I'm going to tell you who won. I'm going to tell you who I felt like the MVP of the match was. Now, interesting to note There are often times in my lists where the people who were the MVPs of the matches were not necessarily the people that won the match. And that's very important to note, uh, the ability to really see people shine. And you can shine when you lose. And that's that's a huge characteristic to have, I think. It's very important to be a great loser, if that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. So anyways, also I have the move of the match. So essentially we're going to break down one big moment in the match and how it happened. It might not be the finishing move. It might be the finishing move. Who knows? Uh, We've got a lot of other stuff to talk about, too. So I'm going to hype going into Bound for Glory with what we get in the pre-show, which is footage of Abyss's Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Okay, so... Austin Aries gives a beautiful speech about Abyss and everything. And then, due to some squabbling that had been happening on Twitter, 
a height joke had been made at uh, Austin Aries apparently, and it had then he brought uh, Taya Valkyrie, who is Johnny Impact's real life wife, into it by talking shit about her. So at the Hall of Fame, Austin Aries straight up just fucking calls out Johnny Impact, who's sitting front row of it, and it literally in seconds erupts into chaos. Fists are flying, people are getting pushed, people are screaming. There's a bunch of people, like, Abyss is standing there in a suit and trying to, like, enjoy this moment and, like, break it up and whatnot. I'm sure part of him was also soaking it in at such a genuinely iconic moment for the business, and there's a lot a lot of reasons I say that. Uh, it was It had to have been a little bit cool for him to have that iconic moment happen at his Hall of Fame. Like, people will never... In the history of ever forget the Hall of Fame of Abyss. Ever. And I tell you what. There are some other people in the TNA Hall of Fame that I don't remember their Hall of Fames. I wasn't also watching the product at the time. But I digress. I guess that's that's not fair to say. Anyways, let's get into this card, guys. The Bound for Glory 2018 card. We're going to work it top to bottom. First up, Rich Swan and his surprise partner, Willie Mack. The Mack is back. Return of the Mack. Return of the Mack. Versus Matt Seidel and Ethan Page in a tag team match. This match was really good. Lots of things to note. First of all, I really want to talk about the MVP of the match, which was Willie Mack. That dude's a big dude, but he moves like a cruiserweight. He gets on them ropes like a cruiserweight, but when he hits you, it's like a fucking super heavyweight crushing you. I'm pretty sure Matt Seidel took a bump that was just like Willie Mack coming off the ropes and just slamming into him, and it was vicious. There was no, it looks soft and looks nice. It's it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It looked fucking brutal. So Willie Mack really in the match, just overall, uh, wasn't in the match a whole lot now. I, I do want to mention that Rich Swan for the majority of the match, gets kind of cornered. Old school dirty tag team wrestling with Matt Seidel and Ethan Page. Uh, keeping Rich Swan away from his tag partner. They build to the hot tag. When the hot tag popped off, it popped off awesome. I mean, I guess they could have delayed it just a little tiny bit longer. But I know you're also dealing with your your time limits and time constraints and what you're supposed to do. So Rich Swan makes the hot tag. Willie Matt comes in. Boom, 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 boom. They're whipping that ass. Now one thing I want to say is that Willie Mack did a fucking, this is a move of the match for me, Willie Mack did a fucking standing moonsault like it was nothing. He just was standing there and boom, like Apollo Creed style. Whatever happened to Apollo Creed, by the way? You don't be seeing him getting pushed on WWE programming anymore. Or at least I don't see him. Maybe he's a protege of John, John Cena. John Cena. This is John Cena. Uh, <laughs> anyways, another one. Oh, that was awesome. So... Rich Swan did this front hand spring into a swan cutter, diamond cutter thing that was also fucking bitching. It was a, definitely another move of the match where I was just like, oh my god, I can't. Like, they actually, that was a really cool thing to have them pull off. And it looked really good and fluid and nice. Uh, ultimately, Swan and Mac pick up the victory. And in the post, after they do like a little quick. I don't. I don't. It was kind of a promo for the company that obviously is advert uh, that um, obviously is sponsoring Impact's Bound for Glory, which I can't remember. It was a C company, but uh, like the letter C, not uh, like in the ocean, a C company. So uh, they're talking about like people getting put up to the front row or some shit or whatever, and that was cool. And then Willie Max said. We set this bitch on fire and then threw the mic down. He was not wrong. They had one hell of an opening match. Uh, up next, we got a quick like backstage segment with LAX where Conan got jumped. It, eh, it was really shitty. I, I don't. They're. I hate to say it. That's the one thing that TNA is really bad at is their backstage segments and making it feel like it doesn't. When people are out there wrestling, it feels like wrestling. But when they're in their promos, it feels like kids in high school recording promos trying to get it right. And I know not everybody's amazing at promos. I'm not. I'm not claiming to be good at promos at all. Uh, but 
it's just it there's a there's a, a shift i don't know if it's how they film it or it's something about it there's something about how they do this that just makes me kind of shut down i thought it was a really boring weird segment because it's like oh my god conan's been attacked what the fuck is happening you know uh crazy so then we boom back to the ring where we've got eli drake a, 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 an amazing talker he was very fantastic to listen to on the microphone and listen to him talk about this open challenge he uh says he wants to face anybody from new york in an open challenge doesn't matter who it is and all of a sudden out comes james ellsworth who gets booed the fuck out of the building you fucking suck fuck you ellsworth we don't like you fuck off everything you could think of people were yelling at him and chanting and whatnot and uh eli drake even noticed he's like fan favorite huh like you're not the, the hype that wwe built you up to be not a lot of people really like you james ellsworth which eh, he neither here nor there anyways james ellsworth versus eli drake match does not last very long it's a two minute 10 second squash with uh eli drake hitting not one but two of his finishers the gravy train it's almost like the celtic cross uh that sheamus does uh so the match is over and eli's like come on i want some real competition like this is dumb he that was a joke he's not even a new yorker boom abyss's music hits abyss just runs down whips that ass choke slams eli drake through a table uh, it didn't actually get considered a match, even though the ref started to be out there and then it wasn't a part of it. It was very confusing, but I, I, it doesn't matter. It's still an entertaining bit. It made Abyss look amazing. I thought he was the MVP of that portion of the card. And then, of course, I thought Eli Drake just shined through and through um, winning that match versus James Ellsworth. Uh, up next, we had... I don't know. This was a match that I was really, really excited for. Like, I... I Tessa Blanchard was on the uh, all-in card in that amazing Fatal 4-Way and won, I do believe. And uh, Taya Valkyrie, I had kind of gotten a briefing on because of the shit that had been happening with Johnny Impact and Austin Aries and that she had been drugged into that or whatever. So these two put on a fucking amazing match. They went 10 minutes, 36 seconds for the Impact Knockout Championship uh back and forth and I tell you what Tessa Blanchard typically looks really strong against all of her other opponents because she's built a little bit differently she's a little bit more muscular and a little more ass kicker Taya Valkyrie is just on that same level but different bodybuilder galore and just pushed right back it was a very evenly matched bout now the ending of this match is interesting because Taya Valkyrie actually hits her finisher on Tessa Blanchard who grabbed the ring apron. The ring apron gets stuck up on the ring, so the ref starts fucking with that. Taya gets a clear one, two, fucking three. Easy before the ref even gets over there. Then when he gets over there, he gets a two and a three quarters count, so almost six count worth of, of time has passed. Taya should be the knockout champ. She does not, however, win. Ultimately, Tessa Blanchard picks up the victory. Uh, I will say the move of the match, which I fucking dug, was Tessa Blanchard did a flying code breaker off the top rope, and it looked so absolutely wicked. Like, just the way she performed it, the, the way she... I, I don't even know how to really describe it. It was just the way that she... Uh, my cat's going crazy, if you guys can hear that. But uh, I don't know. Just overall, that was a cool flying code breaker. She just had the, the fluidity of it at all. It, it's hard to do a, a move, I'm sure. I've I'm, I'm not actually ever been in a professional wrestling ring in that capacity. I've stood in some professional wrestling rings in the past, um, meeting people like Jeff Hardy and AJ Styles and Joe and whatnot. But... Uh, Cammy, knock it off. We're recording a podcast. We're recording a podcast about wrestling. And you're not invited, Cammy, because you don't talk about wrestling. You just meow. So anyways, drink break brought to you by looks like we're going to get poor entertainment. Check that out every other Tuesday right here on the Journey into Comics Network. Coming up this week, you got Journey into Comics 1, 214, and then you got Poor Entertainment Episode 6, I do believe. 
and then adulting ain't easy, and then podcastrophe, and then Gallifradio, and then another episode of Brews with Dudes, and then back around for the end of the week. Best of the week. So that's what you guys got coming up this next week for Journey into Comics Network. Now, let's get back to that drink break brought to you by Poor Entertainment. Delicious Pepsi Cola. All right, back to it. Okay, so Tessa, Taya, awesome match, mad kudos to you guys. Up next is kind of what I thought was a li- one of the two shit shows, kind of, of, really, uh, of this card. Eddie Edwards versus Moose. Now, these guys are former best friends. Moose turns on Eddie Edwards to go into this storyline with Austin Aries, align himself with Austin Aries, become more of a heel. And then, oh, shit. That's some Journey into Comics news, but I can't talk about it. Fuck. I'm sure Journey into Comics will be covering that. So anyways, uh, Eddie Edwards versus Moose is a singles match that ends very fast by disqualification. Uh, Killer, uh, Killer Cross shows up and fucks up Eddie Edwards, meaning that Eddie Edwards wins by disqualification. Um, and then out comes Tommy Dreamer with the save. Dreamer and Eddie Edwards get put into a tag team match to go up against Moose and Killer Cross. So here's a couple things from this. First of all, uh, the MVP of the first part of this match is Killer Cross because he just shows up and beats the fuck out of Eddie Edwards. And it's like, oh, <clears throat> and what did you expect? You know, I don't, I don't really know what else you were expecting. Uh, Eddie Edwards does win there. There was no move of the match because there wasn't really much moves. It was just all of a sudden it was into bullshit, I guess. This tag match was fun, though. Eddie Edwards, MVP of the tag match. I didn't really spot a move of the match that really stuck out as something that was incredible to me. But there were some interesting moments that happened that made me write down some shit to remark to you guys. So there's a hilarious chant. You sick fuck. You sick fuck. You sick fuck. You sick fuck. Right? Uh, because Eddie Edwards drank water out of the mouth of Tommy Dreamer to spit at Moose. You definitely heard that right. Uh, regurgitated water into Eddie Edwards' mouth to spit into Moose's face. It was very, very sick, but the crowd let them know quickly that you're a sick fuck for doing that. You sick fuck. You sick fuck. Right? So... Ultimately, Eddie Edwards and uh, Tommy Dreamer pick up the victory. It was nice, great match, fun, short, didn't go crazy long, about nine and a half minutes. Not bad. I was happy with it. It was good. So here's the thing. This was where I had to stop watching for a little bit and then pick it back up. So there's like a little shift in how I'm going to talk about this stuff because the Moose-Eddie Edwards match to me was just okay. It wasn't my favorite thing of the night. Uh, neither of those wrestlers really sell me as, oh man, I really want to get behind that guy or be on that dude's side or chant for that guy and nothing like that. And the next matches have more of that, but different. And that's what we're going to talk about. Up next was Ohio versus everything versus Brian Cage, Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. Pentagon Jr. Having just come off that match versus Kenny Omega at all in. What a great match that was. Uh, Ohio versus everything made of Jake and Dave Christ and Sammy Callahan. This match was OVE rules, essentially a no rules type match. Uh, what do I think of this match? I think that I was thoroughly impressed with Brian Cage. I feel like he's a fantastic athlete. I feel like a lot of guys that size get flack for being big, but they don't have any... Uh, you know, they don't have any skills. They don't have any sk- They're They're not really that skilled or talented of a professional athlete. And really, Brian Cage, MVP of this match easily. Flying all around, doing all kinds of shit, all kinds of amazing moments, uh, throwing people around, throwing two people around in one go. I mean, it was intense, genuinely intense wrestling, and I loved it through and through. I thought it was great. All right. So, Brian Cage might have been the MVP, but he did not have the move of the match. 
The move of the match for me was definitely the Phoenix cutter from the ramp. So Phoenix is outside the ramp. He'd been like thrown out or knocked down or whatever. And he jump flipped and then knocked and hit. I think it was Jake Crist with a diamond cutter type thing. It was wicked. Like if you guys can check the highlights out, definitely go search those out because this match had some amazing spots, some interesting spots, and actually a massive fuck up. Uh, one of the members of OVE like damn near crushed the other one, and with the, when like with his foot. But that also, while that was happening, Phoenix Jr.'s head hit. I think it was Sammy Callahan. Phoenix Jr.'s like top of his head or top the bottom of his jaw hit the top of Sammy Callahan Jr.'s head like simultaneously. It was a fuck up. So the crowd all chanted, "You fucked up! You fucked up!" Which is always a fun chant to get in professional wrestling because like, well, you can't edit that out. That's your crowd. You know, that's real. That's the realest shit. That's the realest shit you're gonna get. Ultimately. OVE wins this match. I mean, was there ever any question? They say that Ohio is the professional wrestling capital of the world. I disagree. But I thought this was a really good match. They did a really good job of telling this story. Uh, It made both sides look strong for different reasons. Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. working together in that match had a lot of great spots, a lot of great moments. Uh... This was one of the better matches on the card for sure. And not to say the card was bad. We're going to get into that and break that down here in a little bit too. Uh, I thought this card was great. So up next was the Concrete Jungle Death Match between LAX and the OGs. Now the OGs are Hernandez Homicide, who are definitely the original LAX. And King, who was like a loose member later in 2008, I think. And then the current Latin American exchange, which is Santana, Ortiz, and Conan. So Conan, K-Dog, Kato, uh, obviously recruiting Santana and Ortiz is much younger. And they are also your Impact Tag Team Champions. You're wondering, Nate, what in the fuck is a concrete jungle death match? I've not heard of this one before. Let me tell you some shit, my friends. This match was terrifying. As a fan of wrestling and a man who has knowledge of what happens to the body when real dumb shit happens and you get hurt, like being Calamity Nate sometimes in my life really made me appreciate this match on a whole different level. So literally they uncovered the ring. The only thing that was on the ring for the wrestlers to take bumps from were the 2x4s, the wooden 2x4s that go across the whole ring. But they aren't, like, drilled in or anything. They have to have give and kind of move with the flow of wrestling so that that when the bumps happen, they're a little gentler. So these planks just move and create space. Not even into the match. We're not even... The match hasn't even started. And one of the planks is already up and offset. So if anybody takes a bump on that shit, it's a sharp edge that's going to fucking wreck, let's say, their back or their knee or whatever they were to hit. It would fuck them up or they could twist their ankle even. Right? So... The match doesn't even start, and everybody's trying to get this fucking board down, and everyone's kind of panicked. The match starts, and K- oh, also, can I mention, no um, turnbuckles, no protection on the outside. It's literally, the ring is as exposed as it can be. The softest thing in the entirety of the ring is the ropes, and they're really not that soft either. Uh, so it's a legit, like, fucking war. And let me tell you something. This professional wrestling match turned it up to fucking 12. Like, you think that the Attitude Era was intense? And I'm not talking about hardcore wrestling. I'm just talking about the way to tell a story. But um, one of the members of LAX, current LAX, I think it was Ortiz, yelled, you're going to have to kill me first, motherfucker. As loud as he could, it, dude. And there were constant middle fingers being thrown and fuck you motherfuckers and you're going to fucking die motherfuckers. And it was intense. It was fucking vicious. That was the word I want to use. It was a vicious match. Ultimately, one of the planks got removed during the match. So then there was one less plank, 
but that also meant there were more spaces where you could literally fall in between the planks directly under the ring, right? Nothing to protect you. No fucking joke, man. This is not a fucking joke. This is a very real, very serious match, what they did here. The bumps looked horrendous. It was terrifying because they would start running, and the planks would move with their running because they're getting traction from the planks, and they're pushing them behind their feet to get traction and then jumping and doing crazy things. And uh, I want to say, like, 20 seconds into the match, Homicide is already gushing blood. He, like, fell or took a bump to the outside and nailed something weird, but he fucking got dinged hardcore. Uh, This match was brutal. Of course, now Conan was not a part of this match because he had been taken out in the backstage earlier. So it's Santana and Ortiz in a two-on-three against Hernandez, Homicide, and King. King took a fucking wild bump in this match. He tried to do a suicide dive between the second rope, but he miscalculated, obviously, or his foot slipped when he was going to launch or whatever, and he catapulted himself directly into the barricade between the fans and the wrestlers and, like, fucking KO'd himself. He did not look like he was all there and, like, he got his bell rung a couple times. So uh, what do I think was the winner of this? Or what did I, who did I think was MVP of this match? Ultimately, I have to tell you guys what happened because I tell you, the OGs had these guys beat the Latin American exchange. And then out of nowhere, Conan's music hits. He comes out with a flapjack. He starts smashing the fuck out of these motherfuckers like it ain't no tomorrow. Ultimately, LAX picks up the victory. Ultimately, Conan is the MVP of this match. Was there a move of the match? Not really, because it was just a fucking war, a battle, a fight. Uh, It was a battle of attrition. It also had to be terrifying, because like I said, every second... Oh, and there were table bumps, by the way, in the ring. There were two table bumps inside of the ring uh, that were fucking brutal also. And I tell you... Uh, mad love to LAX. The, the, both teams look strong, and I think it was a great thing. Having the OGs is like a new faction. They were the original Latin American exchange. It builds to this. Maybe this feud is over. Maybe it's not. If it is over, the OGs have to become a part of LAX. That's my opinion. And just make a bigger stable that can then you know position into the board to do some different things. You need some big team overlording your entire roster to make some real interesting tension, uh, but you don't want to do it too fast. So maybe you can, you know, let this go into one more match and they can put something else crazy together. Who knows? We'll have to see what they've got coming up. So we got one more main match of the night. Now between the LAX match uh, and the main event, there was some weird pre-tape backstage segment with magic and I tuned out immediately. I had women, and it just was degrading, dumb-looking, and I wasn't into it. And uh, maybe I should have given it a chance, but I'm not going to give it a chance. I'm just being fucking honest. I don't want to give it a chance. It looked bad. I'm judging it by how it looked. It looked shitty. I'm not a fan. Don't keep doing that dumb shit impact. Like, I get it. The Broken Universe was great. It was fun. But that was not great or fun, what you made us go through. But you, they had to do that. They had to have like that 10 or 15 minute break because they had to set the ring back up that they completely tore down. Like, dumb. Why didn't you think about this? Like, I would have maybe booked this differently. Maybe this would have been the first match of the night for me. I don't know. I digress. We're not going to get into all that. Let's get into the main event of the night because this is where shit gets hot. We got Austin Aries, champion, with Killer Cross and Moose coming out against Johnny Impact and Valkyrie, Taya Valkyrie. And let me tell you something. This was a actual fight. There was a lot of real shit going on during this match. There was not a lot of professional wrestling going on for at least the first like eight minutes, I would say. The first eight minutes was real. What I mean, and it still happened throughout the match, but I mean, almost immediately Austin Aries got uh, Johnny Impact in a guillotine. And he was trying to choke him the fuck out. He goes, do you want to go to fucking sleep right now? I'll put you to fucking sleep right now. Do you want to go to sleep? I'll make you go to sleep. Are we going to do this now? Like, he was, woo, 
revved up and gearing to go. This feud boiled over into real life, or it was maybe one of the greatest works that we don't know. But I think that it's uh, it's definitely coming from that shoot vibe. It had that feel. There were some really hearty smacks and punches thrown at each other and kicks and knees to the head. I mean, literally, Austin Aries need Johnny Impact in the top of the fucking skull. The very top of his fucking dome. You know, so... To me, uh, this match... Like I said, the first half of it was really, really physical like that. And then there was some wrestling and like some pinfall attempts and whatnot. Uh, move of the match, I got to give it to Johnny Impact did this crazy thing. They were outside of the ring fighting each other. And there was not a lot of space between the barricade and the ring on certain sides. Like two sides were real close. Like re- I'm talking, you know, you could run, but you couldn't do a whole lot of shit. Like it tight quarters. So... Trying to think about this. Okay, so Johnny Impact is they're like smashing each other. He does a ta uh, a whip into the barricade, and Austin Aries runs at him like he's gonna kick him with the sweet chin music, but then like runs through it, and Impact jumped up, so Aries goes under him. Impact puts one foot like jumps and lands. One foot on the ring, one foot on the barricade, and immediately on instinct does a moonsault and kicks Austin Aries in the fucking side of his head. It was wicked. It was the easily easily the move of the night. Not just the move of the match, but the move of the entire night. It was one of the wildest spots I've seen um, so quick react like that because it seemed very real that he just on instinct said, fuck you, I'm going to do this thing and fuck you up. And they didn't, there was, it didn't seem like there was any planning of this match. Like they went to war. The end. They went to war there because there was not a lot of swings in building the crowd. This was just a fight. Uh, who do I think is the MVP of this match? Taya. She got in her, uh, involved just verbally by talking and saying, fuck you, little man, and whatnot like that, and flipping off Austin Aries and whatnot. And Austin Aries staring her down a lot during the match, which was intense as well. And then uh, I just, it was weird because I didn't know if Austin Aries was like trying to be sexual towards Taya or like intimidating, but it kind of was like almost like he was trying to be like, you, you want to you wanna like, you want to come see my dick? But uh, that was not the case. Uh, she was very unpleased and unsurprised by, uh, unamused by Austin Aries and his uh, his ways. But she took a nasty bump. Oh man! So this is one of those things where, again, I don't know if they planned this, but if they didn't, holy shit! I would. There was some anger, right? So. Uh, Austin Aries comes off through the ropes uh, on a suicide dive into Taya. Taya? Taya. It's Taya. Uh, Into Taya and like smashes her into the barricade. She nails her head on the fucking uh, barricade. (laughs) And she was just down, down, down. And as soon as it happened, Impact like freaked the fuck fuck out and just started haymakering and just fucking up Austin Aries and smack and punch and kick. It was brutal, you guys. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Ultimately, Johnny Impact hits the Starship Pain, pins Austin Aries to become your new Impact World Champion. Here's an interesting thing. He hits the move. One, two, three. Austin Aries stands up walks to the apron, no selling the move. Like, it didn't hurt him. It didn't bother him. He just, the match was over. He had to do what he had to do. And now that the match was over, he was done giving a fuck. His shoulders were pinned to the ground. So then he got on the ring apron and started flipping off Don Callis and saying, fuck you, coward, and flipping off some of the fans and shit. It was crazy. He was so violent and going crazy. And fuck you and fuck this. And you could tell that, Everything that happened in the ring between him and Johnny Impact was very personal throughout, and it didn't seem like a shoot at all. So let's get into some reason or some stuff. Uh, it seems like 
uh, Tessa Blanchard just spoke out about Austin Aries. And uh, let's see what she had to say about the incident at the end of Bound for Glory. Tessa says, I just think, or I think it was just a lot of Austin being Austin. That's, I honestly don't know what to think about it. Just watching it, I was kind of just like at a loss for words, I, I guess, because I don't know what to think. To myself, yeah, of course, I'm sure everyone has a lot of questions. There is a lot of uncertainty. The whole locker room was kind of not really sure what was going on, I guess. But yeah, I honestly, I'm very indifferent because I don't know what to think. I'm not really sure what Austin was trying to accomplish. I think that if the roles were reversed and Austin was sitting in the locker room watching that happen, I'm sure he would feel disrespected. I'm sure he would not be so happy. He'd have some things to say and some questions. So if the roles were reversed, I'm sure he would be in the same position as how the locker room kind of felt, I think. I agree with her, Tess, uh, speaking out and saying, you know, he wouldn't have been just okay with it. So... I don't, it's, yeah, I don't know. I do not know. This is a weird thing because it's like Austin Aries seems like his contract with Impact Wrestling is done. Uh, And we're going to get into this. Before we get into this, though, I want to rate this card overall. Honestly, it was a very solid effort. I'm I'm genuinely impressed with uh, Impact Wrestling. Comda.com was who sponsored them. Uh, But ultimately, Uh, I'm going to say this was a solid 3.75 pay-per-view card for Bound for Glory. It's their big, like, um, WrestleMania-type thing of the year. Or Slammiversary is that, I guess. Bound for Glory is more of, like, their Survivor Series, you know. But, uh, yeah, 3.75 is a solid rating out of five stars for this pay-per-view event. It definitely left me wanting to watch more Impact Wrestling, which I did, and I actually watched some of this following week's, uh, this previous week's Impact, uh, where the obvious thing was like, I wanted to see if Austin Aries came out, I wanted to see if Johnny Impact said anything about Austin Aries or anything, and man, let me tell you, they did not stray from burying Austin Aries, and I mean... Listen to me. They did not hold back. They definitely said, go ahead, say whatever the fuck you want, because you know what? Fuck that guy. He uh, he he didn't have to do us like that, and he did us super dirty. And it seems, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems that Austin Aries is done. Uh, PD Williams said this in his recent podcast saying Austin Aries contract is done. That's all I'll say. That match was his last match under contract with impact. Uh, Aries has reportedly gone home and isn't expected to be a part of this week's impact taping. He wasn't. There are still people debating the whole Aries impact incident as a Vince Russo style worked shoot. As previously noted, Aries' behavior at the end of Bound for Glory has gotten fans talking. After being pinned by Johnny Impact, as I said earlier, Aries immediately got up and pointed towards Don Callis flipping off the crowd and then abruptly walking out. Yeah, it's... uh, And like I said, Johnny Impact is not the only one that directly called out Austin Aries because Phoenix came out to challenge Johnny Impact for the title next week, which has me interested in wanting to watch next week. See, look what they did. They've got me hooked. Good wrestling gets me hooked. It's not always about the story now. It's a note, note WWE. WWE has really good promos, but really bad wrestling sometimes. And TNA or Impact Wrestling has really great wrestling and shitty promos. So... My thing with Austin Aries, I'm going to just close on this, is it, seem like, it seems like everywhere Austin goes, he burns a bridge. He was He's not three-time Impact Champion, three-time Impact World Champion, and you're acting like a dickhead at your final thing and walking out because they said you have to lose. Like, he was probably trying to renegotiate his contract where he would win, also make more money, also do all these things. It's like, I get it, man. I appreciate it. But let the business breathe. Like, let them get their shit together before you're demanding all this shit. And so what if Johnny Impact is now the champion? That's great. 
John Morrison, professional wrestler John Morrison, who I watched back in WWE, I liked that guy. When I watched the first several episodes of Lucha Underground Season 1, it's because Johnny, was it, uh, what did they call him down there? Johnny Mundo, I think? I don't really recall. Anyways, this whole thing with uh, Impact getting me talking is, I just feel, I feel like they've, they're have they on the right path. And I'm I'm giving kudos to the to the impact. If you're not checking out Impact Wrestling, I do highly suggest you do. I want to cover, and I, you know what? I want to shout out to Casey Taylor real quick. If you're listening, Casey, I, I am I am thinking of you, my good dude, because Casey is on this NWA thing and following Cody and what Cody's been doing like closely, and I'm a little bit behind on it, and I really really want to get Casey Taylor on soon, and actually. In a little under a month, we've got something planned where a bunch of people are going to be coming onto the show. We've got a cool uh, idea laid out and planned for Survivor Series weekend. And let me tell you something, folks. If you are in the Lafayette area and you're listening, you're going to want to be a part of it because it's going to be off the chain. That's all I can say. We're going to be announcing it soon, I hope. Anyways... Let's get back to it, folks. So, yeah, uh, Austin Aries snaps twice. He snapped at the Hall of Fame. He snapped after the match. Austin Aries has lost it. He's burned bridges. We're done talking about that. Let's go on to WWE Crown Jewel, or are they just Blood Diamonds? So here's a little bit of interesting thing where politics and real world is crossing over into and affecting WWE. So months ago, many, many months ago, when we had the the biggest Royal Rumble or whatever, the greatest Royal Rumble. It was in Saudi Arabia. It was a very nice event. The Saudi Arabian government is like this government that seems like they're on the up and up and all this good faith, and they're trying to do things right. And then the real world thing happens, and this uh, Washington Post journalist goes to Saudi Arabia with his fucking fiance, and they go... Uh, to sign something or do something at the embassy and the Saudi Arabian government tortured and beheaded this fucking dude, cut his fingers off one at a time, like all sorts of grotesque shit in the seven and a half minutes that his wife was out waiting or whatever. And then like tried to cover it up. It's fucked up. It's fucking gross. So right now there are a lot of politicians and fans like WWE why are you going to Saudi Arabia where some really terrible shit has happened to an American human? An American person was murdered for doing their job. They work at the Washington Post, a renowned fucking company. I mean, I mean have you ever seen The Post? That movie's great. Great opportunity to tell you you should watch The Post. So, we've got some stuff to discuss involving this crown jewel thing and what's going on and, and the the who's it's and the what's it's. So, some people are curious why WWE doesn't want to cancel. And Dave Meltzer commented on the situation. He said this, I heard most of the production people didn't want to go. Basically, what I've heard is the majority of people in the company are very much against doing the show, but everyone in management, for the most part, is for it because they're afraid it will hurt the stock prices, and that's a real big deal right now. One of the reasons why the stock is so high is because WWE is expecting $450 million over the next 10 years from Saudi Arabia. Essentially, they don't want to lose all that money in the next 10 years, $45 million each year over the next 10 years, essentially. Um... So it's more about money and less about people. WWE kind of looks shitty on you. Just saying, I just want people to know the truth. I mean, that's really this is really shit that's happening, right? So we've got a couple things. Um, WWE has issued a statement, and also one of the personalities has commented on this. So WWE issues a statement saying, an article on Sports Illustrated website noted the following regarding WWE talent, the upcoming Greatest Royal Rumble event. That Greatest Royal Rumble event's not right. 
they mean to say crown jewel in Saudi Arabia. Speaking on the condition of anonymity, multiple members of the WWE talent roster have expressed discomfort with the idea of performing in Saudi Arabia, especially given the nation's poor record with human rights. Uh, WWE issued a statement to NY Post regarding the matter. As always, we maintain an open line of communication with our performers as we continue to monitor the situation. So now, a WWE personality has kind of said some shit about what he feels about Crown Jewel, saying, Podcast host Sam Roberts, who's been featured on WWE kickoff panels in recent months, has said the following about Crown Jewel. He says, I'm okay with the deal. Saudi Arabia has done a lot of questionable... Okay, I'm okay with the deal. Saudi Arabia has done a lot of questionable things, but I'm okay with the deal in general, Roberts said. But my own personal opinion is that because of this story, and because honestly the U.S. is still figuring out whether they're going to have to retaliate against Saudi Arabia, I don't think the crowd jewel should take place in Saudi Arabia. I think that the show should go on. The show must go on. A big investment has been made into the show. And I think it's going to cost WWE. It's going to cost them money. And I think WWE has got to eat this one. Uh, they were featured on Vice. They were featured on John Oliver this week. And it's not good press. He added, I would expect that the WWE have a backup plan already. And at this moment, if you ask me today, I think they should use the backup plan. I think the WWE needs to figure out how to do this show outside of Saudi Arabia. If they want to go back, go back. We can have that discussion separately at another time, but for this one, for the sake of everybody involved, I think it would be a better thing if they did it outside of Saudi Arabia. I fully agree, 110%, Sam Roberts. Uh, yeah, it's, cra it's crazy because my opinion is kind of the same. I think that they should do the show. The, like The Crown Jewel event shouldn't get canceled, but it should not happen in Saudi Arabia. Maybe look to um, England or something, somewhere, Britain, maybe Wimbledon. You know, it's like just refund those people their money and then offer this thing at Wimbledon. It'll sell out in fucking minutes. It'll sell out in seconds. People will go. It'll be a huge thing. You'll get to televise there. And you'll still make some money, right? Uh if that's what's the concern. But I think that it's crazy that a dude who's an American human person was beheaded and WWE just went, meh, money's more important. We'll lose $450 million. That guy's one life is not worth $450, $450 million, a lot of money. It's not as much as that crazy lottery that happened over this past week that I won. I don't know if I won. That was just a don't find me because I don't know. I, I probably didn't win. I just wanted to say that because it's like a shock value thing. But anyways, uh, one more thing I want to talk about WWE related. Two more things, really. I got two more pieces of news for you. First of all, I want to mention Kevin Owens genuinely injured out six to eight months with a knee injury. He's going to have to have knee surgery. A lot of shit going on. Lots of really bad timing for him, man. It kind of works, though, because I feel like KO's in a spot right now where he's a little bit buried Injury sometimes can be a blessing in disguise. You get off air for enough time, people really want you back on TV. You're gone. You can come back repackaged, a little bit tougher, a little bit different. Get thrown into a big spot where they need change to happen unexpectedly. Have somebody, maybe he comes back by. I mean, I guess the Royal Rumble's only three months away, but if he pushes himself, maybe, who knows? You know, maybe, maybe he'll be able to do that. I don't know. Uh, but he is out for a bit, so no KO. That's sad. Uh, but let's talk about Ronda Rousey. Oh, my Lord. WWE did one thing right. They hired Ronda Rousey, who wrote a beautiful, scathing, redonkulous promo that she cut on the Bellas. I mean... Check this out. According to Brian Alvarez, Ronda Rousey's promo on Raw towards the Bellas was written largely by Ronda. Uh, that Ronda Rousey promo on Monday that I thought was excellent with the exception of a few lines, she wrote the entire thing herself. She did not have a writer. She wrote that, he added. The line about the Bellas' name being a stain on society, she wrote that. That's how she talks. Speaking of the R Ronda Rousey-Bella match, Dave Meltzer is reporting that the match announced did lead to a surge in ticket sales for Evolution, and the pay-per-view event is now expected to sell out. So that's good. Uh, Rousey's talented as fuck, 
And it's been great seeing her work uh, in the WWE in her short time. She's not even been here a year. She's already the champ. She's kicking ass. Like, she's making a really brilliant legacy for herself. And I think that you guys should keep your eyes on the prize. Hey, that's the number from last time. So, we're here. Holy shit, we did it. We're at the end of the show. But we've got one more thing before we go. As we've been doing, we're going to kind of try to keep doing this thing, um, bringing it back from last season. The random highlight, I have 10 names on the list. Last week was Mankind. Uh, he was number three. We've replaced him just for the sake of this week and what we've been talking about. It's very topical to add him into the thing. Johnny Impact is going to be added to the list at number three currently. So now what we're going to do is... I'm going to hit the random number generator a total of three times because last time was number three, so we'll hit it three times this time. The third time, whatever number it is, we're going to talk about that wrestler. We're going to talk about their history, whether they're, uh, well, we'll see where they're from. Let's go ahead and do it. Here we go. I'm going to close my eyes. We're going to do a one, two, three. You guys are probably going to hear the mouse click. Ready? Here we go. And one, two, three, eight. Oh, ho, ho. Oh, shit, folks. This is an interesting one. Oh, I just threw that cup on the floor. That's how excited I was. I threw a fucking cup on the ground because, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Heyman, right? I can't do a Paul Heyman very well, but Paul Heyman, amazing, amazing, talented, phenomenal human in the world of professional wrestling, and I say that because of this. Here's the deal. Paul Heyman breaks onto the scene in the 90s as the guy that brings ECW to life, uh, making it something special and different and extreme. And Eastern Championship Wrestling becomes Extreme Championship Wrestling, all on Paul Heyman. And you guys have seen the rise and fall of WWE, and or the rise and fall of WWE shit, the rise and fall of ECW. Uh, but I'm telling you, man, Paul Heyman is kind of a visionary. If he would have had more money in the 90s and had better uh, ability to get visually a larger audience, I think that they would have maybe taken over both WCW and WWF at the time because they were kind of cutting edge. They were pushing the bounds to limits that people were even going, holy shit, we can't show that. We can't have Beulah McGillicuddy's titties showing out on TV at Barely Legal 97. Like, what the fuck? You know, so Paul Heyman had this long storied thing with ECW and just like was the stalwart that created it. And then it's done and it's all over. And what does he do? The smartest thing, he gives it to Vince. He says, let's run with it, man. Let's see what can happen. And then they do the invasion storyline and Paul Heyman transitions from a manager again, talking on behalf of the alliance with Stephanie. And here we go. It, it starts one of the greatest storylines, in my opinion, in professional wrestling. WCW, ECW versus the WWF, Team w, Team Alliance versus, uh, you know, everybody else, essentially. And it it was cool, man. And it was weird because there were some names that should have been there that weren't there. And you don't have RVD at that time. And, and Sabu wasn't a part of it and whatnot. But you had some guys from ECW that were there, some WCW guys that were there, again, not necessarily the WCW guys you expected or wanted there. Maybe you were hoping Goldberg or Sting or somebody were, but that, that didn't happen. Let's get back to Paul Heyman. Heyman transitions and does some commentary, as he had done in WCW or in ECW and whatnot. And then in 2002, just <sighs> the next big thing breaks onto the scene. And we get our first taste of Brock Lesnar, and he is a genuine monster, a genuine devastator. And who do you have talking him up? Who do you have selling him as the greatest that will ever be? Paul Heyman. You know who was also a Paul Heyman guy? CM Punk. He was best in the world for a reason, and I mean that. 434 days. One of the greatest championship reigns of all time, CM Punk, because of Paul Heyman. Brock Lesnar's title reign, which I think beat CM Punk's title reign, possibly. Paul Heyman. So I want you guys to think about it, man. Paul Heyman is a manager that has literally kind of done it all, right? 
I mean, he's done some storylines. He's done some goofy shit. He's been the commentator. He's been a heel. He's been a face. He's been with champions. He's tried to bring up people like Curtis Axel and all these things, man. Paul Heyman genuinely, genuinely deserves a special spot in the Hall of Fame. His own very special wing, the Paul Heyman wing. Because, man, that dude gets it. He gets it. He is a visionary for professional wrestling. And uh, maybe he'll do some more interesting stuff. Maybe he'll have another super talented future star to help bring up. Um, But Brock is supposed to be at Crown Jewel. They can't even sell that pay-per-view right now because of all the shit that's going on. So, anyways, folks, before we get out of here, as always, you can check out the Journey into Comics and Journey into Wrestling podcast at journeyintocomics.com on the Journey into Comics network. Go to iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Spotify. Search Journey into Comics network. That's where you can get all the shows on our network in your face also, don't forget to go to podcastropypod.podbean.com to get Podcastrophy's show and give them some love. You want to subscribe to them. They're still a part of the Journey into Comics Network. They've got extra content, though, that you can just get on their feed that's just like whenever they can record it, it just comes up. You'll always get your show on Thursday. Don't you guys worry about that. But, uh, you know, they have some fun extra content. So if you're a fan of Podcastrophy, don't forget to go there. Also... Go to patreon.com backslash journey into comics and give us some fucking money. I'm not kidding, folks. We need your support. We need your love and your help. You've been listening to our shows. We've been seeing the downloads coming from all over the world. Give us some dollars to get that early access, the exclusive content. You can get buttons, stickers, fucking t-shirts. I'll give you lessons on how to podcast if you want to podcast, but you're afraid to podcast. There are so many tiers we have available for you. I mean, I'll help you develop a podcast for our fucking network if you give us some fucking money. I don't care. I mean, I do care. I genuinely care. I just, we need more help, folks. This is me calling for help. The Journey into Comics Network needs help. Let that help fall from the sky. Please help the Journey into Comics Network and let that help fall from the sky. Patreon.com backslash Journey into Comics. All right, folks. Well, this has been... Season 3, Episode 6 of Journey Into Wrestling. We're going to call this one Glory Bound. I have been your host, Nate. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Later. <laughs>